going to, uh, to, to, be, to get going. This meeting is being webcast, uh, and I'm told that there are over 200 people on the webcast at the moment. We've had up to 350 at various times, so uh, we'll be able to take a, a reading as to who are the most popular pa panelists based on who stays on the, the webcast. But in any case, uh, we do have a, a six-minute um, video uh, with regard to the most recent report on diagnostic errors in healthcare, and we're going to play that uh, at the end of the break, uh, which follows this panel uh, from 2:30 to 3. So, any of those, any of you want to see that uh, particular videotape, uh, just come back a few minutes early uh, from the afternoon break. Uh, as I indicated to you. Uh, these panels were put together largely by their moderator, uh, and we're delighted to have a panel uh, chaired by uh, Dr. Pronovos, uh, keeping in mind that uh, he needs no introduction. He's, his work has been referred to umpty -um times this morning. Uh, I'm very pleased and proud of his work because I believe he represents an extraordinary generation of young investigators who became interested in patient safety. Uh, not just from a theoretical point of view, but from the point of view of making change. Uh, you heard reference to his classic report from Michigan about catheter-associated infections. He's done far more than that uh, subsequently, and we're delighted that uh, he's moderating this session and he'll introduce his panel. I will note for you that his creativity is reflected in the makeup of this panel, which is not what if you would call entirely made up of traditional academic students of patient safety. So I think you're seeing Peter's creativity in, in, in action. Dr. Pronos. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ken, and I'd uh, just like to begin by thanking the original panel for this. Uh, your work really freed up the potential for people like myself to jump into this full steam and make a, a career uh, out of it. And it's really an honor to be here because folks like Don and Lucian and Brent and Ken and Chris Castle have all been mentors to me and, and the field and myself owe you a debt of gratitude. And it also shows where we come from that original report because now I'm honored to say two of our Patient Family Advisory Council members are in the audience here today and uh, you bring a welcome voice to this work. So uh, uh, thanks a ton. <laughs> And you heard people referencing uh, John Eisenberg, who my wife was pretty fortunate enough to work for, about the power of uh, stories. And you know, indeed, stories are amongst the most powerful force for change. They either pin us to our current performance or pr propel us to new pinnacles. You change the story and, and you change everything because they define how we act in the world. They define the kind of cultures uh, we create. And 15 years ago, Tara Juman told a, a dissonant and disturbing story about U.S. healthcare. In addition to performing miracles, healthcare harms. And in part because of the story we tell, that harm is just inevitable. We have to seem to accept it as a cost of, of, of the care we d deliver. Uh, our journey, my journey, to tell a different story. Uh, began on a snowy night also 15 years ago when <clears throat> this adorable little girl was taken off of life support and died. Uh, she had been burned but died of a catheter infection and her mother Sorel, an amazing woman, challenged us to do something about it and I'm just delighted to say next month in collaboration with authors from HHS, ARC and CDC, we'll be reporting that the compared to pre to urge human, these ICU infections, catheter infections, are down over 85% across the whole U.S. It's, it's a remarkable new story. And in reflecting on that, we thought, well, what did we learn that might inform some of this other work? And first, I think the, we learned the improvement in this effort was informed by a valid and crystal clear measure. The improvement was informed by a systems approach where we started with the clear purpose of zero infections and worked backwards to design a system to achieve that. An improvement worked through 
a peer learning community, not by extrinsic motivation and saying doctors you don't care, but by tapping into that real power of intrinsic motivation. But when we dug deeper, when we interviewed clinicians and partnered with anthropologists to help that, what we found was that indeed the magic sauce was the clinicians told a new story, that they started saying these infections are inevitable and there's nothing I can do about it, and they evolved to telling a new story that no, these infections are preventable and I'm capable of, of change. And you can see that change in their eyes when you spoke to them. And that new story came about really from two simple attributes. They believed they could and they belonged to a peer learning community. And we felt pretty good about that story until I had to look at the mother of this little girl. And nothing humbles you like looking in the eyes of a mother whose child died needlessly. And Lenore said, Peter, why is it acceptable that you can tell Sorel that her daughter is less likely to die, and my died, again, 15 years ago, and is just as likely to die today as 15 years ago? There's been no progress in this. And I left that conversation troubled and s spoke to some of our engineering colleagues at the Applied Physics Lab, the, kind of the people who put the Pluto satellite up, by the way, and they said, Peter, how many harms could a patient suffer in healthcare? And I said, you pick 15, 20, a, a lot of them. They said, when we put the Pluto mission up and say it can blow up for 2,000 reasons, and it doesn't blow up for reason one, call it clabsy, but it still blows up, do you think we'd pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, but that clabsy didn't get us? <laughs> You're thinking about this wrong. You need to say, how do I design a system and that doesn't harm? And so we went about to try to do that in our organization, to try to create a leadership, a governance system, a management system, a data system that's all integrated that eliminates harm because we so often talk about culture as something out there. But culture is us. Culture is the governance, the leadership, all those things together that we create that make us safer. And so we started reflecting what stories are holding us back that we might need to change. And I think the first story is that safety is a project rather than a performance system. That we don't have the measurement systems, we don't have the governance and the accountability all integrated into a systems approach. A second story is that safety is based on the heroism of our clinicians rather than design of safe systems. We haven't taken a systems engineering approach for zero harm and we need to. And finally, the third story, and we heard a lot about this today, is that safety relies on extrinsic motivation rather than intrinsic motivation and peer learning. We use an economic model that you just don't care enough, doctor, and if I take a nickel away, I'm gonna somehow make you care deeper. But I think that isn't misguided. It may impact the quantity of care, but it does very little for the quality of that care. So today, you're going to hear from three leaders who have told different stories in their respective industries and are working with us to tell new stories in healthcare. And trust me, these aren't pie in the sky stories. Every one of these are actively working on applying their approaches in healthcare. Uh, to my left is Scott Showwater, who is the incoming chair of the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board and is gonna talk with us about how we might take valid measurement systems that the finance industry does and apply them to, to healthcare. And we've been speaking with Chris Castle and others about getting very concrete about this potential. Next to him is Conrad Grant, a faculty or fellow colleague of mine from Johns Hopkins in the Applied Physics Lab. Conrad builds missile systems for ships. He's gonna share with us how we might use systems engineering to improve care, and he's gonna build upon some of the work we've been doing in the intensive care unit that's been funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. 
And finally, next to him is Ricardo Cirelli. Ricardo's a senior manager at the World Association of Nuclear Operators, the entity that has no regulatory role but that emerged after Chernobyl and Three Mile Island to support peer-to-peer -peer review in nuclear industry. And he's been guiding us about how we might apply those principles when we looked at what it takes to get to zero infections. We've applied them with our colleagues at, at, at MGH. And so we thought together we would share with you these ideas so that we might begin together to tell some new stories, perhaps evolve these stories that are holding us back. And I'm fairly confident uh, that if we do, we'll be able to look Sorel and Lenore in the eye and give, give them a resounding uh, yes to their question. So with that, let me introduce Scott Showalter.